went to uh, to two meetings, two marketing meetings in the last few weeks uh, at random times. And one of them was discursive and long, and didn't give any particularly good advice uh, about how to how to sell more books. And the other one had a very strict agenda and was very helpful. And it was really more like the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Reasonably bright people, and uh, which is a very good experience. <laughs> I will speak for myself. I'm really pretty. Good. Um, I'm going to let you or encourage you to introduce yourselves. But go ahead. Uh, my name is Jason Kennedy. I uh, am a book buyer at Barnes Noble Company here in Milwaukee. My name is Jason Grunebaum, no relation. Um, I'm a <laughs> translator from Hindi and a fiction writer, and uh, I teach at the University of Chicago. My name is tragically not Jason, but Antonia Lloyd Jones, and I'm a translator of Polish literature full time based in London, and um, that's all I do. I'm John Masjak. I work for a uh, commission sales rep group. We represent publishers to bookstores. I have about, depending on how you count them, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 200 presses that I represent. Probably more, but it's hard to count at that upper level. And I'm Jeff Waxman, and uh, I work for uh, Other Press. Is uh, yeah, I see at least one not of recognition. That's nice. Um, but I've also worked in marketing for the University of Chicago Press, and there I worked a lot with uh, Seagull Books. So between the, the three of them, a fair amount of, of translation has crossed my uh, my desk. And before that, I was bookseller at the Seminary Co-op where I kind of uh, specialized in translation, if in that fact that is a dog, <coughs> which it's not. But it is as far as anyone else is concerned, and kind of how we're going to be treating it today, because you all write in very different languages, um, or read them. But uh, if I were to guess why you showed up, it's because you're looking for a readership um, for yourself or for your author. And there's no good answer for this. They're hard to find. There's, there isn't a readership for books in translation purely outside of the people in this room and at this conference. <laughs> Not even if it is. Like, but when I saw Scott Estadito here, I was like, oh, that was it. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, what, we, what we do have are some guidelines that we can help provide. Um, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of publishers, but I can tell you that I spoke to a couple of different publishers that I don't work for about this panel, and I got some extremely contradictory advice, <laughs> which is funny. Um, you, you're screwed, all of you. <laughs> uh, some publishers are going to want your, your undying devotion to your book and to your author, and it's going to go on for, for years after you turned in your final manuscript with every, with every correction. And others won't want to hear from you again. They said, this is our book now. And let us sell it the way we think best. Um, to, to represent these, these competing ideas, um, we actually have these translators who, between the two of them, kind of represent more or less, I think, the, the spectrum of, a, of what a translator can have. Um, we've got UK and US publications, and India, for that matter. And Australia. Genius guys, they have books in Australia. New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand. Pardon? I've had New Zealand publications. New Zealand. That's Australia. Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> We've got. Uh, we, 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 uh, Jason teaches as well as translates. Antonia only translates, which is a rare breed. Um, Very and, hungry. Uh, <laughs> they're rare because they don't get enough to eat. <laughs> They, uh, and, and, and between the two of them, they've also published with some of my favorite publishers that I don't work for. Um, Melville House and uh, Seven Stories and also a couple of university presses, Yale and Northwestern. And you've also published, I think, some YA as well. Yes? Or, they've been marketed as YA, but that's more my problem. I did a book with a very small publisher who are essentially based in Israel, actually, mm. but had an, a UK, uh, an American imprint, and that was YA. They call it pen light. Come again? Was it Toby? No, they're called pen light or something like that. It's a tiny thing. 
But anyhow, uh, to, to start with, I'm going to say that what I look for from, uh, from a translator is a level of engagement. Um, when the book gets to me, it's already been bought. And I have no say in that. That's what, that's what the acquiring editors are for. And they're very interested in the, the literary merits of the book. The marketing, often, the small houses will come second. And so when I see this, it's already mine. And I have to, to kind of find something to do with it. Uh, the questions I'll ask will be about who you all know. And that's what it comes down to in a lot of cases. Uh, who will review your book? And sometimes it's your friends. And whose books have you reviewed? How often are you writing about other people's work? Everything is a two-way street. You need to be involved with other translators and other people writing about translation to have your work be, be seen by them. Um, so after I ask all these questions and answer them without asking you, <laughs> I'll Google you. <laughs> um, it, it kind of uh, ends up in your court. So I'm going to ask uh, Antonia if she wants to tell us okay. a little bit about her experience. Mm -hmm. well, I think as a translator, you know, I'm, I'm not just a surrogate mother. Those are my children, and I'm going to have some say in how they're brought up. So um, once I've produced a book, I do a great deal to help with the promotion, and I try to work... First of all, obviously, if your publisher has a publicist or a publicity department, it makes a great deal of sense to offer your services to them. And if they say, oh, no, no, we don't want your involvement, you can make them want your involvement by having some very good and creative ideas to help them. And one of the first things to do, if you have a nice live author, which is a great thing to have, <laughs> um, well, it has its pluses and its minuses, but um, obviously it's nice if you can have book events, where the, where the author comes over to your country and you promote the book. Uh, and that costs money. So what you can do is you can help the publisher by telling them where there is money available for that. And for instance, in my case, I'm translating Polish. There are Polish cultural institutes in New York. The representative is sitting over there. And um, in London. So I, will, I make sure I am in touch with the people working in those institutes on the literature side all the time, telling them what I'm doing. It's very much in their interest to know what I'm doing. And then I also tell the publisher, so I tell the publisher that there's this source of money, but I also tell them about things like, for instance, in Britain, English Pen has a promotion fund, and publishers can apply for funding for promotion, and it's very generous. And obviously that's more competitive than the Cultural Institute funding. But there are these sources available. So I help the publisher to know, first of all, where they can get some money. And then I start to have ideas for them. I will start suggesting literary festivals that might suit the writer and try and place the writer at particular events and keep feeding these ideas through to the publisher. And then I will also help the publisher by giving them a list of potential reviewers that I know about, because often I know far more about who's interested in Polish literature than that publisher can possibly know, because they don't publish Polish literature every day of the week. So, and also, and sometimes there are reviewers who I know personally, but not always. Sometimes I just know they've given a favorable review to something else. So I keep lists going. I make sure I <coughs> keep track of who's done what, so that I can then refer to these for the next book. And then um, also I can um, suggest presenters for events. Once you start to get a, um, some events in place, I'm often suggesting who can present the person. So an example is I had a book out with Melville House in May in New York, and I've been working closely with the editor all along to think about what readership this book should be reaching. And we worked together with Sean from the Polish Cultural Institute to set up events for this author. And then Alex Zucker, who probably a lot of you know, who's um, uh, the co-chair of the, the Pan American Translators Committee. Um, it, the book happened to be about the Czechs. Alex translates Czech, so we brought him in as a presenter. So it's all about putting together the jigsaw pieces. And, um, and then the other thing is that this particular author doesn't speak English. So I offer my services as an interpreter. 
And I very often, if, if the author does speak English, I will offer to be the reader, because there's nothing worse than listening to, to your translation being read by somebody in a very strong accent who really is struggling with, with the English. So you can be part of that event. And uh, my involvement comes right down to picking the author up from the airport and having them stay on my couch and, um, and uh, taking them to the events in my car. Um, and I have now had to institute at home the, the terrible bottle of wine, which is the only alcohol I leave out, because when Polish writers are staying, the levels on the whiskey bottles must seriously go down in the night. So I, I now have this as my vengeance on them. Um, so, uh, and then um, another tactic that I have is, obviously, once you've got events set up, you're Facebooking, you're using Twitter, there's all the social media stuff that you can use and get other people to spread the word. Um, and then another thing that I've been trying lately, which has been ooh, it's quite successful, is I identify people who might be interested in this book, who are well-placed to say something about it. And, for instance, this author um, of uh, the book we were promoting in May um, mentioned that he has a favorite, very famous writer and he buys 10 copies of this man's book at a time. So I thought, right, famous writer, you're going to help us here. <laughs> and with a bit of, you know, magic, I got the guy's home address. I wrote him a personal letter and sent the book. Of course, these people are bombarded all the time, usually via their own publisher, with requests for blurbs and so on. But I did it privately. And he wrote back very enthusiastically about the book. Could I send it to famous writer number two, please, who'd been telling all about it? Um, and this book, being about the Czechs, I also had my, uh, a friend happened to be going to an uh, alumni event for her college, and Madeleine Albright happened to have been at that college, so she was given a copy at this thing, and wrote his personal letters back about the book. But I can't quote those people, because those are personal, private contacts. However, one of them's made it a book of the year in those newspaper lists, so that's pretty nice piece of publicity. Um, and that's all just thinking about, now what can I do with this? Who might be interested? What might I do? And keeping the publisher obviously informed the whole time of what I'm doing, so that it's always done jointly and with full knowledge. Um, so you're probably sick of my voice by now, so you should say something now. Are you sure you're not at a book publicist conference? <laughs> <laughs> Because everything you're doing is what pu publicity departments used to do when they had staff. Well, right. That's more or less true. Yeah. And I should, if I could interject, please yeah. to speak to, to some of the points Antonio made, it <coughs> is often a very good idea to push back and somebody pushes you out. Um, it, if if you feel like you can do and if you want to do work for your book, um, you should. And. On the other uh, side of that, you, you mentioned uh, having an author and how great it can be. Um, some of the most successful events I've been involved with have been for dead authors. Yes. And when you have a dead author, as some of you might, um, or even one who doesn't speak English and will not uh, travel, um, which is basically dead as far as the American reader is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, that's why you're here. Um, you can, uh, you can still have an event, and the translator, and Antonia's great example of this, can be the best proxy for an author. And I've seen this with, with dozens of translators, but they're, again, the ones who do it well, the, the Susan Bernowskis out there, uh, Natasha Wimmer, like, they are unusually good at speaking for their authors. And... Uh, I think another thing is that if you were saying that's what the publicity department would do if they had the staff, it is, and, but a translator can do more because you have a much more personal connection as the translator Definitely. and you know that culture that you're trying to sell and you understand far better what this product is. I mean, it's your product. You wrote that book. Um, so you're always going to be able to talk about it better than the best publicist, actually. That's true. And, and it is complicated in that um, there are a great many venues for, for reviews, um, for events that don't want to hear necessarily directly from an author or a translator because they're too close to it. 
and you should let a publicity and a marketing department do their job. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, those personal connections, the people that you've known for years who are in your line of work because you share everything about what you do, um, th those, are, those are connections that being approached by me doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I, I look like a weird paid show. And when somebody has enough passion and a, and a personal connection to it, um, that, that can make all the difference. Um, Jason, did you want to tell us about your five books of wonder? <clears throat> right. So um, I'm going to, um, I mean, Antonio was talking more about, you know, general things that, that, that people can do, that translators can do. I'm going to speak about uh, one author, two books, and five different publications of, of these two books. Um, so the author is Uday Prakash, uh, a Hindi author, contemporary, living, very good friends, has slept on my couch many times as well um, <laughs> in his, I think, four trips to the U.S. Um, and we've collaborated on two books. Um, one is The Girl with Golden Parasol, um, which was first published in 2007 with Penguin India. So this is uh, book one, publication one. Um, and... Penguin India at the time was just starting a Hindi list. They hadn't, uh, they'd, they'd been exclusively more or less publishing in English, and they were starting to publish um, Indian languages for the first time. Uday was one of the first Hindi authors who they signed up. So um, that's how the translation of The Girl with the Golden Parasol um, was accepted with them. Um, there, I, so this is, the, this is, this, this first story is a story of, of, of things that, um, didn't go as well as they could have gone. Um, the editor who was assigned to the project had never worked with translations before. Um, I think uh, it was a quite a young, quite a, quite a young editor. We got into you know a sort of disagreement, um, and when I say disagreement, you know I, I mean that you know she would she would say do this, do this, do this, and I would say you know emails fifty pages long explaining, walking her through all the choices that I had made. Um, stop me if this sounds familiar to anybody. <laughs> this sounds like it'd be a pretty fascinating text anyhow. <laughs> I haven't looked at those emails in a while. Anyway, um, to, to make that part of the story a little bit short, um, she had a particular relationship with the publisher and that sort of poisoned the, the, the well a little bit uh, for, for that project. So um, not a lot of publicity was put into it from the Penguin India side. We'd get, we did get some nice reviews. Um, in, in, in some Indian newspapers. It was a little bit before social media had kind of taken off in the way that it is now, so our, our sort of options that way were limited. So what we did was a, was a kind of a DIY um, tour, bringing Uday over here for the first time. Um, luckily, I had some photographs of the dean of my university in a compromising position, <laughs> hidden somewhere in a safety deposit box. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, but, but, but for various reasons, I was able to squeeze out some money from, from the dean uh, at the University of Chicago to bring Uday over. Even though the book wasn't technically available here, um, we did some events there. We coordinated with some colleagues in other South Asian departments and did what we could, you know, given the fact that there's no equivalent of an Indian cultural funding institute like the Mm -hmm. You know, institute anything like that. That just simply do doesn't exist, and um, unfortunately, probably will never exist. You know, for India in the, in the same sort of ways. Although there's a private foundation now that that I'm hoping will uh, fulfill some of the role of like the German book office and in, in putting together calendars. But anyway, so that was experience number one. Um, experience <laughs> number two um, is uh, the second book that we did called The Walls of Delhi. Um, which was, uh, it's, it's three novellas, and uh, that book came to be because I was cold contacted by an editor uh, at the University of Western Australian Press. And something about Australians, because they're so maybe lost, I don't know, in this very remote part of the world, they just kind of know everything that's going on in literature <laughs> and the arts. I mean, it's true. <laughs> so, so I was talking about this book, and I, and I, and I pitched her um, this idea for a book of three novellas, which, you know, if you're an editor in general, you have, you wake up in the middle of the night with sort of cold sweats, having a nightmare, <laughs> saying, oh my God, someone tried to pitch me a volume of three novellas. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was a great book, and, and, and she, she is a great editor, and, and she said, let's do it. And uh, we did it. And, you know, I, I thought, okay, University of Western Australia Press, you know, small university press, 
Um, you know, I, I had certain stereotypes in my mind from, from university presses in the U.S. <laughs> and my goodness, so they hired a, like a Sydney PR firm. <laughs> you know, I was getting emails from people with the name, like, you know, uh, Benyathon Oldfield, you know, and things like that. They were setting up interviews on ABC radio and we were getting reviews. And I mean, probably one of the reasons because Australia is such a small you know, market and everybody knows everybody, but that was a, that was a great experience in what a, a publisher and, and, and a publicist can, can, can really do. Um, and then from there, she sold the rights to Hatchet India and then Seven Stories Press. Mm. Right, and Seven Stories mm. Press, um, I'm, I'm, skipping, I'm, skip, I'm, skipping, I'm skipping one other, but Seven Stories Press has just been sort of an ideal relationship, that exactly the, mm -hmm. the kind of receptiveness um, to the, all the different creative ideas that Antonia was, was talking about, um, pitching them ideas about different events that we can do here and there. Um, and so we, we, we cooked up some very interesting stuff with them. Um, so I think I'll stop there. That seems reasonable. I'm sorry? That seems very reasonable. OK. Um, in, the, uh, in the course of this, this little uh, chain, after in, Kind of uh, while these these translators are doing their additional work, um, we've got some other people at work, <laughs> and one of the first people that I talk to after I get the book is our sales reps. John is not one of mine. John is we're, not, a, we're legally obligated not to work together. Now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we really shouldn't even be in the same room. <laughs> but uh, it's a closed door. Marlos, oh, there's a guy. But but uh, but John uh, sold to to uh, my my store when I was a bookseller, and he was one of my favorite reps to come through the doors. Um, he was one of the best read and one of, and a former bookseller himself, so he knew exactly what we needed to hear. Um, he also is a commission rep. Is it commission? Yeah, for yeah. Abraham Associates, right. which reps a large number of university presses and trade publishers. That's so, true. Go ahead. Wow. Uh, <laughs> the good news is I don't have any particular specialty in selling translated works. I sell a lot of different kinds of things. So Cupcake what I books, right? yeah, uh, cookbooks. I sell Grumpy Cat. Uh, I sell pens. I sell journals. Uh, I sell fiction. Uh, so, but what I do bring to my job is curiosity. Um, as a former bookseller, I'm always looking for something great to read. Uh, so when uh, the marketing people and the editors come to our various sales conference meetings and present you know, the upcoming season of books, I'm looking for something good to read. Uh, I'm looking for something new because uh, I started out as a bookseller. I started out trying to convince actual paying customers why they should read a book when they walked in the store. And when I became a sales rep, uh, I kind of kept that job, I just walk in the store and I sell it to booksellers who then have to take what I tell them and sell it to, books, uh, to their customers. So, you know, I do a lot of reading of uh, manuscripts, I do a lot of reading of marketing sheets, I do a lot of reading of finished books after the fact, I'm often playing catch up um, because there's just so many books you guys are making, it's crazy. Um, but the good news is I'm, a, I, I'm a, um, an interested outside observer. I don't have any specialty. I don't speak any other language. I don't even know what it's like to have another language in my head like you guys do. It's very impressive. Um, but what I do know is bookstores, and I do know uh, how to talk to booksellers. And so when marketing people like Jeff come to sales conference and they start telling us that they've got this new book or a new wave of books coming for the season, and they start telling us about a book like a project that something that Antonia has done and she's already got lined up a festival or a reading in New York, and that's the cornerstone of somebody coming to the United States, and then they're hoping to scrape together a tour and maybe send him to Chicago or send her to Los Angeles, or you know, she has a cousin who's come to the United States, and she's in North Dakota, and we don't know, is there a bookstore there? <laughs> All of these things make me prick up my ears because, all right, we've got some things to talk about now beyond just Here's a book that we're publishing. It's been translated. Uh, the cover is so-so. Uh, the author says it's really good. The translator says it's really good. The editor is fairly convinced about it. Good luck with it. <laughs> Actually, having a person in the United States 
for us, whether it be the translator or the author or both, uh, is amazing. It's like, okay, this is something I can hang a story on when I talk to my booksellers. Um, because it usually means that there's going to be something written up in the New York Times or the New Yorker or the major metropolitan newspapers that still exist, whatever. Um, yeah, that, it, it just give, it moves, it bubbles that book up to the top of what I'm going to be looking at to read. Uh, and hopefully it's, it has been well translated. Hopefully I do find something else that I can talk about as a reader who's talking to other booksellers. Um, I don't know. What else, Jeff? Well, I was going to say, this is a kind of unusual circumstances right now in that these people are almost never in the same room. Uh, the translators and the sales rep have kind of layers of buffers between them. And uh, some of the publishers that Jason and, uh, and Antonia have worked with are very, very much like the one I work for. I work for other press, um, like Melville House and Seven Stories, they're distributed by Random House, which means they have the best distribution network in the country, in the world, actually. Um, and so the books are widely available if the buyer, uh, Jason, buys them. Um, that, uh, that said, um, the, those layers also act as a sort of dampening effect. Uh, a translator's passion for their project has to pass on through the editors, to the marketing people, then on to the sales reps, sometimes through a few different layers, because as a distributed press, I don't get to talk directly to this, the sales reps. I do, because I'm kind of a jerk. But I, I'm supposed to go through like two or three layers at Random House. And my bullet points will get whittled down to like three or four of the most salient points according to somebody. I'm not even sure who that is sometimes. Um, before it gets to a rep. And sometimes there, there, you were on a conference call earlier today with uh, Princeton University, yes? Right. And he was, he was listening in, but you probably weren't uh, speaking, yeah? Uh, well, I was talking on your cell phone in public is a Sure. sure way to be rude, but, but a, lot, uh, a lot of times these are these are blind or like one way blind calls. Yeah, where you, yeah you're listening to people it, to describe books. Right. I mean, we were listening to our, our sales director at the press, and we were listening to some of the other marketing folks who were there, each presenting their books and talking through the key points. Um, so there's, I mean, there's room for questioning, of course, when something comes up, and sometimes they'll seek out feedback, especially if there's something regional. My, the group that I work for uh, represents my many, many, many publishers to 12 states of bookstores here in the middle of the country. So, um, you know, there's off, often questions about regional, you know, if somebody's coming to one of the cities here in the, in the Midwest, okay, is there a bookstore we can tie this to, or is there, you know, what do you know, or who do you know? But most of the, these sales conference presentations are, you know, like this, kind of a one-way street. And that's it. You represent many presses, but how many titles might that be that you're presenting in a sales meeting? Uh, the large, the, the large scary number is I travel around my territory twice a year, so there's two seasons. The books are published uh, in one of those seasons, and in the aggregate, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 books that I'm selling each season. So that's your book sitting with 4,900. <laughs> Uh, being presented in one or two different meetings. Which is one rep. Yeah, the, the, from, and that's just one rep. Um, mm -hmm. Random House has two reps for every, uh, every at, at least two, because they also have uh, children's. But, uh, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, more or less. Anyway. Um, for, uh, for every store, and each of them will be presenting like 1,500 to 2,000 titles. So, it's easy to get lost. Um, one of, most of what my job is is making sure that our books, at least, aren't getting lost. Um, other press does 25 titles a year, and out, out of those 1,500 that, that go out, you know, like 10 or so will be, will be with mine. And uh, I actually spend about half of every month visiting bookstores to make sure that they've gotten copies, that they've read them, that they heard about them appropriately. It's kind of a mop-up job. Um, but those people that I'm always mopping up with are, are, are represented today <laughs> because you're the problem. <laughs> 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 
You have Conrad. Um, one of one of one of Jason's uh, colleagues is a man named Conrad who has read just about every book and loved just about every book that I've uh, sent him. And I do make an effort to only send the uh, the books to the right bookseller. I'm, I think on a first name basis with about uh, five thousand booksellers. <laughs> but, uh, That's important. It's disturbing. <laughs> I, I see them in my sleep. <laughs> you, you, you too, buddy. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, the last link in this chain from, uh, from translator to publisher to, to sales rep is, is Jason before it gets to the buyer. And you want to tell them a little bit about uh, uh, the, the reader, actually. The reader. Say. He is yeah. the buyer. <laughs> Go on. Um, yeah, I, what Jeff was saying earlier about translation being a genre, but Genre. I don't, when I get presented books, I don't think of books as being in a genre. Um, I am sitting there trying to get the rep to relay to me why I, why this book should be in the store, why I should be uh, stocking it, how are my customers going to find out about it, um, what's the important um, importance of the book. And a lot of times it's people like Jeff that, you know, does hound me constantly, call me, emails, call me. I've talked to um, uh, who really um, you know makes me uh, take notice of certain books we get into the right booksellers hands we get the reads and that's really important is, is is having your publisher make sure that there's available early you know reading copies of the book out um, there you know the sales on the book will just change if I start off with you know display quantity in the store compared to just representing it as a single copy. Um, but I do sit through a lot of appointments when Mezjack comes through. Um, it's a long day. Um, there's drinks. There's, there's beer. Drinks. <laughs> we have, that is the thing about publishing. There's always drinks. Yeah. We have finished off in my house over a case of beer <laughs> at times. Yeah. So, um, and, and so it's, it's all about the rep's enthusiasm over the book that he gets from the editors that hopefully come down from marketing, from you know, all the different layers that I don't have to deal with. Um, and, and he's going to bring me all the information, the promotions, the possible reviews, um, and, and his enthusiasm. And I would say John is probably one of the best. Um, if he's really enthusiastic about a book, he will bring you know, his accounts, his key accounts, you know, copies of the book to be read pass around and and his enthusiasm in fact he dropped a book off yesterday with I don't think it was a book in translation um, but he was talking to my booksellers as he was walking through the store and he remarked to me today because I wasn't there he remarked to me this morning that he'd be shocked if the book was still on my desk it was but I could tell I had been thrown it around been handled. it had been handled <laughs> um, which you know which happened you know my desk is fair game um, and, and so, I mean, that's kind of how I look at translation. I just, you know, I, I do care about who the translator is, um, uh, personally, for what I read. You know, it, um, like the, uh, what do I say her name, Jenny Erfenbach? Yeah. Uh, her End of Days. I, I, this is the first time I saw a galley of her book, um, a galley of one of her early translations um, by Susan Bernofsky. Um, and when I finally I saw that for the, like, I've never seen a tr uh, uh, an arc of any of her translations early. And we had three people read the book ahead of time. And we're selling it really nicely. It's at the front of the store. It'll be there through the holidays. Um, and I think that's New Direction. It is. New Directions. And it's, it's you know, it means so much to get that early read out there. It's good for the refs. It's good for us. Uh, and, and we re really rely on that early kind of read to know who to sell it to? You know, when I when as soon as I finished that book, I knew six customers that you know I just talked the book up to and handed the book when it came in to the customer. So it's it's very important. And that's how books are sold. It's pretty much one by one for the yeah. most part. Um, I know that I can visit a store in Richmond, Virginia, and I, I get little lists of where our books are selling, um, <laughs> and so I can track by city, and based on that, I can actually break it down by account by which bookstores are selling our books. And if I show up at a store in Richmond, Virginia, and they sell 40 copies over the next three weeks, I mean, that, that puts them over most, ever, most metropolitan areas of, of any size. And this is, this is how it's done. It's, we need the most information, uh, the most opportunities, 
and the translators are, are really the people who are the best suited to give it to us. Um, for, for most translated fictions, so speaking specifically to what Antonio was recommending. Uh, when you finish your book, when you finish the corrections, um, that's when you really have to start working. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You don't always get paid for it, but you know, if they do sleep on your couch, sometimes there's some extra money to pay you out of the Cultural Institute funding, for instance. Um, and there are other things you can do to help the publicity person, such as <clears throat> translate interviews with the writer that exist in the original language, because they don't have access to that stuff. You do. You can be that middleman, um, and uh, you cannot know what prizes they should be putting the book in for. Um, you can um, place pieces of the book with literary journals online in advance. That's another good way of getting people knowing about the book. Um, and, you're, and all the time you're helping the publicist who's trying to sell 50 different books that week. So. Anyhow. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, this, this also, I think, speaks to what, what marketing is. And you keep talking about really great publicity ideas. And what marketing tends to be is uh, the thing that, that aids uh, discovery, um, that brings the book to the reader somehow. And it, uh, it's the thing that knits together publicity and sales. And it's kind of an overarching uh, strategy. And it's what makes what you do into a, an actual commodity. Um, which doesn't sound beautiful, I know. But it's, it's funny you said the word discovery, Jeff. Um, I noticed uh, this, there's, um, I don't know how many independent bookstores there are left in the country. They're growing now. Um, there's more bookstores around the country in the United States now than there were last year, and this is the third at least year in a row that we've seen this trend increasing, so that's good. Um, a number of the, uh, most of the independent booksellers belong to regional bookselling associations in the, around the country. There's about uh, 10 or 12 of them. A number of them this year started referring to their annual trade show as a show of discovery. Uh, for a long time, the buzzword among independents was curation. We were, as though we were looking for ways to winnow down the collection <laughs> Uh, into just the stuff that belongs, which is a good way of thinking about it because it, it, it was a good response to their online comp competition, which can theoretically stock everything that they're contractually working with. Um, but then it also casts the bookstore as a museum. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't know if the discovery thing came about as an, an intentional response to I, that. I think it's, I think it's a sort of trickle down from, from marketing terminology, discovery and awareness being the... Yeah. But, key ideas. I, but it really, I mean, everything we've talked about is just different ways of approaching helping the next level discover these books and the magic within them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for some sort of hint, some sort of glow that I can then share. <laughs> but if the marketer doesn't know about it, then I don't know about it to pass it on. Yeah, the phrase that you used earlier, uh, a hook to hang it on, yeah. is, is, I think, mm -hmm. most apt because that's what everybody's looking for. I mean, that's what you're looking for when you're uh, selling it to a, an editor, mm -hmm. and that's what they're looking for when they when they pitch it to me. And we, we all need to find that right hook, mm -hmm. which is a boxing term, so unrelated. Um, one thing I was very impressed in this country, I was at Book Expo America this year with an author, and um, it's the first time I've been there for that. And they had a day before the actual book fair mm -hmm. opened when there were just booksellers admitted, which I've never seen that before. We don't have that with the London Book Fair. And that was wonderful. And these booksellers were really enthusiastic, mm. and they were queuing to talk to my writer and everything. It was really, really good feeling. And then after everything was over, I went off to the small town in Massachusetts where my stepmother lives. And there in the bookshop was my book in this small place. And I said to the guy who owns the bookstore, who's a friend, because I go there quite often, I said, how come you've already got this? And he said, our person was there at BA, saw this. Oh, it's yours. Oh, you know, he, he didn't realize it was mine. So thank you, Book Expo America. <laughs> the only person I think who's ever thanked me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't knock it. It was, it was her first trip there. Uh, yeah. it, it is magic the first time. <laughs> <laughs> was it those green pills they handed me at the door? Was that <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah.
But uh, if anyone has any questions, I think we, we can probably move on. Go ahead. Hi, um, I just published a book with a very, very small publisher. Mm -hmm. um, and first of all, what you said about um, an editor going through, a young editor going through and completely yeah. screwing it up, yeah. and probably not go back to the book, and then write 50 pages, and then explain it. I just did that. You know, but um, I'm wondering, like they said right off the bat, they, they can put up a website and talk to a couple people, but the promotion is really on me. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so I'm sort of flying on the seat of my pants. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me what I shouldn't do. <laughs> and also, another question, I have to be judicious with the books I hand out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, when, when is it better to hand out a hard copy instead of an electronic copy? Ask the person you're about to give it to if they read electronically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because if they don't, you're wasting that <laughs> tiny little bit of electrons. But then that's, if they don't, if they say I don't read ebooks, then it's probably a better use of your time to give them one of the finished books. What language is it from? Russian. Um, yes. I'm just wondering if there's things that I might be doing that look kind of silly and naive, and well, like I'm not very professional. What you want to make use of, I think, is that there's an enormous Russian population in this country, and if you think about large parts of New York, Boston area, there's a great Russian population. And one of the things we looked at with this Polish book I translated about the Czechs was where are the Czechs in America? They happen to be in Nebraska or somewhere like that. I can't remember. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they're all sitting there. Um, <laughs> more than, more than in the but you can use that because you can bet, for instance, with Polish books, in, there's a lot of Poles who live in Greenpoint in New York. So there's a wonderful Polish library and there's a wonderful lady who runs the library who is more than keen to have us come and promote Polish books there, as Sean will attest. And I bet you there are Russian libraries, <coughs> Russian community. And okay, you're not trying to sell to Russians specifically because they can read the book in Russian. However, I find that people who are, I suppose immigrants isn't the right word because these are people who've been here a long time, but they're very, very interested. And often there's a whole next generation that is cut off from, from their own original culture and language. They want to know about it. So if I, was, if I had a book like that with a tiny publisher and no money, I would try to set up, and uh, supposing I, I don't know if your author can come here or... He just was here. Oh, okay. But you can do this on your own. You can set up library events where you read from the book and talk about him a bit and, and just do a little show. And you can do that same thing in each place. But try and make use initially of those Russian communities. Public libraries are very good. I, I quite often, I've started doing in Britain a little show where I talk about various books that I've translated and I read little bits and make it quite varied and short pieces so I don't bore people. I try not to anyway. Um, and, and, and then I have a few books to sell and it's always really, really successful. Um, so that, that would be my advice on that. And the, uh, the Russians, the Poles, the Chinese, in any city where they have any sizable population, they have their own media. Yeah. 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 And, and, and those newspapers are very well read. And it's a start. They may not be the only people you want to sell a book to, but it's a very good place mm -hmm. to start. And, and, yeah, I would inquire about, I mean, you know, even it might not be that expensive to advertise in some of those newspapers, but even if you can't do that, just to make some contacts with some of the um, editors there to let them know about it. There's also, because we, I mean, just carrying on what Antonio was saying, there's also often um, local radio stations for those communities. And even in New York, we have mm -hmm. a, a Polish sort of yeah. like yeah. slightly public access television yes. station. And we've done interviews with authors on that. And the thing that we find is that, particularly with more established expat communities, and we found this with Butler, um, mm -hmm. Poles would buy a book because they read it in Polish years ago when it was out, and they bought it to give to their American friends. Yeah. <laughs> they want, I get this in Britain a lot. There's a lot of Polish recent immigrants to Britain. And, of course, all the British men see those Polish girls, and, you know, oh. nature takes over. But the Polish, <laughs> the Polish girls want their British boyfriends to know about their culture. So they come and buy these books at these events. For their stone stone. It really does. Not. They do. Seriously. You, I've seen it happen with that book. That's the thing they want to share. Right? Right. Or they have a free stone upon stone upon stone. Upon stone. <laughs> That's how we get a fourth generation of those. <laughs> 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 
and, uh, and speaking to the idea that you, you might look amateurish, I mean, I am anti-professional. <laughs> uh, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a great many people who know about for how unprofessional I can be. <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't believe sometimes that the, the veneer of professionalism is good for a book's discovery. It helps that book fade away. Fade, fade away. I don't know. It, uh, it's easier to gloss over because everything's being presented the same way. So your yeah. passion is more important, exactly. really, yeah. than some publicity publisher's name at the top of a piece of paper. In fact, I have known publishers send out books, and I've said, I'll send it to so-and-so. He'd be really good to read it, or she'd be really good. And they say, oh, no, no, we'll send it. You're not sending it. And then there's no, it does, like, what the, the polls say, a, um, a, a plum into to compot. I don't know how to say it in English, but like a stone into it down a well. Um, and, uh, but then I've sometimes subsequently sent that book myself with a personal note and got a response. Mm -hmm. Um, because these people are being bombarded with professional stuff. Yeah. Um, and often it's your love and your passion that will actually look far more attractive than something official looking. That's something I don't do anymore, is I don't type letters. Um, everything I send out is handwritten. Um, Interesting. A, a, yeah. a, a personal pitch <laughs> and a handwritten letter is, is so much more useful than anything yeah. that just looks like a press release. Yeah. Because I've thrown away more press releases than I've read. Yes. Yeah. No one reads them. There's a question it almost here. Amazing, I've written. Oh, well, that being said, I mean, what, what, is there any point or is there any market in the country of, of the original author for an English version, or for that matter, and a book that I'm working on is the psychological response of a man living in Portugal. It's fictional, but you know, under the crushing economic situation, and perhaps even you know, what would the English version do? Perhaps even in the European Union as a whole. I mean, definitely for the books I translate, absolutely, because there's a huge population of Indians who simply wouldn't, wouldn't read the, the Hindi version for, for any reason. So, um, I mean, any book I translate, you know, will at some point be published in India. Um, in terms of the sort of ideal marketing, though, it's published first, you know, in the West, either in the you know, U.S. or the U.K. to get that sort of you know, uh, glow of legitimacy, and then, um, and then they go, oh, yes, this is something we're very interested in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know that any of us can speak directly to how a book would be sold in Europe. Next year, an editor on the panel. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, 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 and then only maybe because the way translation rights are carved up, like I only ever end up at least, at least now. I mean, in the past, I've had stuff that had well, really well been with rights, but ninety. Five percent of the books that I work on are either North America or mm. just the United States. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but uh, good luck with that. Why you got experience? That was pretty hard. Right. Maybe channel that goes. Hey. Hey. So there's a lot of comment to that. So I translate from Chinese, and English in China is very much a prestige language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's very much have a friend who is a, um, a, an editor in China who agreed to sort of serve as a representative for my, it's a book of um, translations of poetry of a very well-known poet. And those, he managed to get it into some major bookstores in China. It's actually been selling, I think, better than it's been selling in the States. I was wondering if that, if that actually could end up being the case. Yeah, because it's, it's just there's so many people in China and they're very interested in reading. Such a nice story. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that, that's not beautiful. <laughs> when can I get the next flight over? <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question is, so is it, I, I you know, I sometimes, like, I'm like, I mean, I suppose that would be both, you know, this is like a guilty thing we do. You go into the bookstore and you look to see, yeah. is my book? Uh, uh, if you don't, don't, don't be guilty. Really? Okay, thank no. you. No. Yeah. And if it isn't that, right. make, make, that make them feel is, guilty. That is my question. So if you, if you find your book there, you can sell it. If you don't, what do you do as the translator? Can you? Is there anything you can do to get your book in there? I, I, yeah, I, say my name, I say, hello, my name is Antonia Lloyd-Jones. I translate from the Polish. I have a very good friend named Jason Grudebaum who translates from Hindi. And I'd like to tell you about how fantastic his book is and that you should have it. I do get people to go and 
ask for the book. Do you, does well, that I'm afraid I do. <laughs> and then well to well order it. Oh, really? You know, well, per, most of my relatives have had to do this. Oh, you haven't got it. But didn't you see this review? Oh, but I've been mean, so hoping to get it. You know, can I, but we can order it. How quickly can you get it? Like, you know. And the other question is, when you do, that's great. Okay, I'm glad I will get some friends to do that. And if you do, <laughs> yeah. why not? Yeah. No, no, don't laugh. You absolutely should. And, okay. and library yeah. acquisitions, too, are very Request Educate base. them. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and if you do find your book, is it? I mean, this is guilty. Is it useful to buy it, like yourself? Oh, to buy, to oh. see, you if know, you have a decent is? contract, you should have uh, be able to buy it from the publisher at a discount. Oh no, I don't mean so. that. I mean just like, oh, we sold a copy of this. Oh. No, no, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Kind of priming the pump. As priming it were. the pump. Yeah. That's, that's it. what relatives are for. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything your relatives and, and don't Tony's do? Antonio's family is <laughs> even poorer than she is. They, they, <laughs> they, never read, copies. they don't have to read the thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get one of yeah. them. Um, um, so I have a, a question in terms of uh, publicity and, and, uh, and getting attention for your book. Um, what are your views about, and, and the unprofessional, um, book bloggers? I, I mean, I was one. <laughs> I, I, I think they're great. Um, they are not publicity. They are, to my mind, pre-publicity. Uh, so many book reviewers and uh, and uh, review editors read bloggers to, to know yeah. what to look for. And booksellers read them. And booksellers some, very frequently are them. So if you can get away with distributing electronic copies, uh, assuming, of course, that your publisher doesn't have the budget, to, uh, to distribute to every blogger. I mean, frankly, I, like, I, there, there are not people that I don't send books to. Um, because I, I, I don't know what's going to work sometimes. Um, there are people that I'll send them faster. But, uh, but a book blogger is, depending on the size of the blog, the readership, almost always not a bad idea. Um, there's a very good blog called Pen Atlas, if anyone's interested, which exists to promote translated books. So um, take a look at Pen Atlas on the English Pen website, and you may you can there's a possibility that you can offer them something, maybe write something yourself or have something by the author. Okay, so they're always looking for good ideas. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. And I, I mean, I, I always thought for you know the next next book I translate, what I'd like to do is sort of keep a um, ongoing bloggish diary of mm -hmm. you know the different translation mm -hmm. choices I made, mm -hmm. and you know kind of allowing people a little bit of an in, you know peek behind yes. the, the, the scenes. You know, and, and yeah. maybe packaging that as sort of a deluxe edition box set, you know, type, <laughs> <laughs> you know, type yeah. of thing. Or if if not that, then so at least the you know list. have the link there, maybe in the book, um, where people who are who are curious about that sort of thing could go, and um, you know, and that's also um, serves various purposes too, helping to educate people about translation yeah. and the process, and you know. Um, you know. People love those things. Yeah. If you write about what you're doing, or you write mm. about. You, from the translator's point of view about your experience of a book. And, and you can write a nice blog, and there are various places to put them on the internet. Lots of good Do places. Um, and some of those people, those editors who publish things like that, are here. Yes. Yeah. Can't see any of them. Right now, but <laughs> Isn't there a session on um, yeah, maybe online it's on right now, journals? I think it, maybe it's on right now. But, <laughs> but, uh, but those people can be, can be really helpful in that way. And one of the things I do is I spend a lot of time soliciting uh, recommendations from booksellers, um, and once I have them, if I find something that's spectacularly well written, I say, hey, do you want to meet a review editor? Because I think you should be a reviewer too. And building a, a additional like, extra reviewing, like core of reviewers for books seems to be one of the most important things that I could be doing. So whenever I find anybody who has like even a glimmer of intelligence, <laughs> um, and, and says something that I haven't heard before about a book that I've been been pitching to people, I uh, I'll say I, I want to put you in touch with other people. I want you to be writing about books, and even if they're not mine, because building up that that kind of a culture where everyone is interested in, in everything that they could be, and writing about it. I mean, a, a book that's unreviewed. Never happened. Even a bad review, which pu which publicists will uh, will say sometimes, uh, there's no such thing as a bad review. 
I mean, I'm, I'm with them on that. At least it's part of a conversation that's happening. Like somebody criticizing your book is an opportunity for somebody else to defend it. It's not, sad. not you. Don't ever. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just never looks good. Don't, don't engage. <laughs> but, uh, more about books that I read in Russian, and so, um, and I write about them, you know, people say, oh, geez, I don't think you can really get these, and so, you know, agents read my blog, and publishers read my blog, a lot of translators read my blog, and I get a lot of translations, people send me their translations, publishers, translators, and I'm starting to write more about what I read in translation, mm -hmm. because I get all these books, and I feel terrible that I don't read enough translations, and I want the publishers to be recognized, and I want the translators to be recognized. So my point to you, to you that actually are bloggers, um, don't just look at book bloggers per se. I don't really think of myself as a book blogger, um, but it, although I do blog about books, um, but look at people who might write about translation. Look at people who write about the culture. That, mm -hmm. I don't know what language you translate from, but um, look at people who write about that. And to follow up on what Jeff said about books that don't get reviewed, um, I don't necessarily write about every book that I talk about. You know, I may not write about a book on my blog, but if a library asks about something, I might mention this book. Well, I'll revise okay. it. Mm -hmm. A book that is, that is undiscussed. Right, because there is a lot of discussion that goes on offline. Yeah. You know, people email me all the time. I get lots of things like, what's your new book club for the year? Um, you know, would you recommend a book for the book club? But if somebody has specific criteria, I'm looking for a book about World War II that blah, 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 blah. Maybe I've heard about this translation. And I haven't read the book, but I might still recommend it. And there are a lot of odd ways that I try to connect people with books, even if I haven't read them. You know, but I've heard about them. So it has to widen that experience. You know, you're looking at the entire place. There's actually a subset of book blog. Of, I mean, the. There's a yeah. whole cadre of book bloggers who seem to exist mm -hmm. just to echo their own echoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, and and they, they self-identify as book bloggers. But the larger community, I think, is what I was thinking about while you were talking is, yeah. you know, you, yeah, I belong to a certain other communities. You guys have a, a really solid community here of translators and world literature experts. Um, reaching outside of that, you know, thinking a slightly broader about the publication of the things that you're working on, getting to know booksellers. There's a, a very diverse and active group on Twitter, uh, mm -hmm. Tumblr, of books, booksellers and publishing people. There's nothing stopping you from engaging them, talking mm -hmm. about your books, There's gen gently, them from excitedly. You. That's right. That's, That's right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like you say, you know, you're a person who blogs about words and books, not a book blogger. And people like you everywhere are probably going to be interested in. Your books. Um, do any of you, any of you, I guess, have advice for actually working with big publishers? How, how big are we talking? Well, I mean, I feel like you know, I've been fortunate, but maybe not, to work with big, you know, like not necessarily big, big publishers, like Chad Hughes, but the publicity department. <laughs> Yeah, that's nice. Sold really well, really well, but it was fantastic. Yes. But then other ones, including the ones you said earlier, I discovered at some point had not been chosen because one of the ones I saw that said, well, we'll publish this, but we're not going to sell it. Um, and so then it died. And yeah. Nothing happened. And, you know, uh, there's, um, it, it's, it's, it's too late by the time I figure out that they're not doing anything with mm -hmm. it because the book's already out. I, would, I wouldn't take no for an answer on that. I would, even if some of the books are getting wonderful marketing budget and they're really putting 50 grand into selling it, which is very nice, um, I would still try to get to know the people in the publicity department at some level. It may not be very easy, but it's worth trying. And try, just write to them. Just write to them saying, oh, I'm so thrilled with what you did with such and such a book for me. I'm, it's really nice and I'm very grateful and I particularly like this. Or, um, by the way, did you know this and this and I've got this coming up and it will be so nice to meet you. I hope we'll have a chance one day. Just write a kind of friendly letter like that. Appreciate what they're doing. 
and be a human being and and address them as one That's and see where you get <laughs> see where you get to um and that must be very annoying because i mean <laughs> Oddly enough, as a translator of Polish, I have rarely worked with <laughs> very big major publishers who have loads of money to sell things. I'm about to have this experience. But, um, I hope. Uh, but it's interesting that it's not always... Because they don't want people to perceive... People, they want people to forget that it's a translated book, don't they? They don't like translation. Yeah, they're a bit allergic to it. Well, then they've got to be educated. That's what I think. It's about time they learnt, and everybody can learn, that translation isn't some sort of weird thing. Oh, I've got to read the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know people who won't watch film because it's subtitles. I mean, what the hell kind of nonsense is that? And it's the same with Everything translation. Everything I watch in English, I watch with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I'd rather read it. <laughs> But anyway, we have to get these people educated. Don't don't take no for an answer. They can move our way. <laughs> and those publicists, they may, you know, their boss, their mandate may be to just not to worry about. Don't bother the little translator. They they did their work. Let's let's go. Mm. They're they're looking for a hook too. You, your author should be able to help you too. Get your author yeah. to treat you like a co-author. I don't know what the authors like in well, this case, but. Yeah, well, the author can help you with that by making a noise. Uh, and, and, and it's also something where a big person has less experience. Yes. Yeah. The publicist is really wary of But they are wary of it. They do have this thing about it. Yeah. Mm. I am a translator, and I don't bite. <laughs> I don't put people off. You know, I have, well, yeah. perhaps I do. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um but it's this perception that people don't want to read translated works, so the translator's name is going to be tiny at the back, and we're going to pretend yeah. that this was written in English. I'm preoccupied with this because <laughs> I, I have no idea where that thinking comes from. It's I've never dumb. met a, a bookstore customer who no, right, gave one not. way, gave any kind of a damn, like, of who course. wrote the book, really? Yeah. Yeah. They want to know if it's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the great myths of publishing, mm -hmm. like short stories don't sell, novellas are hard. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should make a video at Ulta oh, next year, kind of a, yeah. a, a, a mock what horror is... movie <laughs> of a reader discovering a book has been translated <laughs> and all sorts of terrible things happen and the zombies start coming out and, you know, we can send that to publishers so they can realize how ludicrous it is. Down the hall. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, the translators are coming. <laughs> <laughs> You mean it was written in a foreign <laughs> language? <laughs> Smoke up. When English was good enough for Jesus Christ. Read that question. Oh, hey. Go right ahead. Yes. Um, you were talking about uh, having to bring your author to the Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is what happened. Um, uh, the fiction editor of the New Yorker, um, she was very interested in my translation of this novella on the Arab Spring mm. and it was published last year in the New Yorker. Wonderful. And it turned out to be a miracle. Since then, if the publishers were approaching me, book after book, asking me if I would please translate. about the you know the North African sensibilities and, and uh, the issues that there are, especially regarding the Arab Spring. So I think it's a little sad that there might be better translators out there and better writers out there who are not taking any comments because
Well, you know about them because you have that language and you have access to their work. So why don't you try and promote the other author's work to the publishers who are coming to you begging for, for um, Jaloon? Um, you can take advantage of that sort of crack in the door that you've got. And you can also recommend other translators if you know them. So I would I would take that opportunity and use yeah. it. <laughs> there are a lot of translators who do that kind of work. Um, I don't know if they call it their free time, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I read um, uh, an Arab lit blog that uh, Marsha Qualey puts out, and she's a translator. She's also the only person I know who's writing thoroughly about Arab literature. Um, there's um, what's it? There's a there's a, a blog called Love German Books. Yeah. Um, there's Translationista. Like these are all translator driven uh, report reportage really on what's happening in this this particular literature, and a lot of it hasn't been made available to English readers in any way. I mean, there's a lot of favors you could be doing for people in that way. Actually, I was looking for translators for the Probably someone at this conference yeah. who would be only too happy. Because somebody in the room is looking for work. We have the the match make, the speed dating service uh, of all time between author and translator. Yeah. You know, I thought it was so interesting that you say that you write handwritten notes uh, to people, and then I just wondered. This is the first time in my life I've seen a sales rep or a sales Yeah. Is there Ordinarily, I'd say, yeah, like, let anarchy reign. That sounds fine. <laughs> but it, it also sounds like a real pain in the ass. <laughs> what if they offer you drink? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Is that there is room, um, but, but it, it, you, you have to find it in a bar. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> honestly, once there's some kind of, of social connection made, and alcohol helps, Really, there's room for almost anything, I bet. <laughs> well, we'll look at it this way. I'll, I'll be downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> if I mentioned that my problem with Chuck is his ulterior motives. <laughs> but the, uh, depending on uh, who publishes you, uh, your works, um, the secret is uh, if you get the catalog that your book is in, at the very back of the book, is a list of who the sales reps you are, ah, usually, yes. or at the very least, they're or at least you know what their companies are, exactly. or what what company is handling sales. The as as Jeff said, you know those who are distributed through the Random House Monolith, something like call that. It that. Um, you know they're kept pretty pretty remote, but they exist. Uh, they travel by night. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, and get to know your. Uh, your local bookstore. Yeah. 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 Walk into a bookstore and introduce yourself. I mean, that yeah. was said before, yeah. but <laughs> we've had translators in our neighborhood where, you know, we weren't carrying them, but we didn't realize they lived in our neighborhood. And as soon as we realized that, we were able, we started stocking them and, and making sure they have it. And sometimes it's just you know ignorance on our part, not knowing who's around us, and yeah. just you know walking in and introducing yourself is huge. Yeah. We we don't bite either, so we're we're all fellow travelers, and we you know. <laughs> If you introduce yourself friendly, in a friendly way to the, your local booksellers, they're not going to be offended. The your, the um, the Glenn Close model of introducing <laughs> yourself that that usually doesn't go over well, but you know. Um. But I mean, I've got from when I was a bookseller, I still have like a dozen customers who call me up asking for recommendations. I mean, it's been a few years. Um, we have Yo, I'm sorry. This is going to be the last question. We're out of breath. We, have, we haven't really talked about online sales specifically. Um, when, when I talk to kind of like, I feel like sort of semi lay people, like people who are mostly readers, but who sort of like follow what's going on in the publishing and kind of read the kind of books that I'm interested in. One of the things I hear over and over and over again is, oh, well, you should get all of your family and friends to review your book on Amazon. Mm. And this is like the most effective thing that you can do. Is, is, do you have any 
Uh, I mean, our, our books. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> our books sell really well on Amazon. Um, I, I don't care. <laughs> they're, they're going to continue selling well. Amazon's discovery, for example, is so heavily managed. Um, Paid for. There are not accidents on Amazon. What, 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 once, what, once upon a time, for reasons I don't want to go into, um, I had about 10 German-speaking friends of mine bombard the German translation of The Girl with Golden Parasol with fantastic reviews on Amazon, uh, DE. And, um, well, if nothing else, I, it felt good to sort of feel like I kind of gained the system a little bit. Did it work? I don't know. That's, that's, that's the short answer. It doesn't hurt as long, probably, as long as they're not, you know, obvious put-ups. Because sometimes I, I read reviews, I'm like, well, this was the author. <laughs> yeah, you can see the guys and stuff, yeah. 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 I don't like that. Right, right. last, real, real last one. It's a, this is a very quick comment, actually. There's a whole other group of people who are like cringeworthy agents who can sometimes be helpful or consistent. If you find that you're being shut out by yes, random house, it's true. Yeah. we often get our clients who have, because sometimes our clients get shut out by random house publicity. But well. nobody shuts out your boss. But not my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just forget about that. Anyway, um, and sometimes, because agents are very good at being diplomatic, yeah. they can, and they also, because they have to pay the They can be great yeah. intermediaries. They can be great intermediaries. And <laughs> but all right, uh, thanks for uh, now, I guess. <laughs> I was hoping to be the